Thank you so much for staying late on this uh, sunny Saturday, and I'll try to get you guys out uh, on time. Um, and so this is a, a very wide field now um, with a number of immune effector cells, including uh, CAR NK cells, engineered TCRs, gamma delta T cells. Um, and just given time constraints, I'll focus on CAR T cells. So I think that's the most exciting where we've seen the most clinical responses. Just note, as a medical student, I did buy some stock in AbbVie. I still hold, but I don't have any other relationships to disclose. Um, and I'd like to start off with uh, my favorite CAR T-cell-based comic. There's not a lot, but uh, this is my favorite one. Okay, so I have blood cells growing out of control. So you're going to give me different blood cells that also grow out of control. Yes, but it's okay because we treat this blood with HIV. Are you sure you're a doctor? Almost definitely. <laughs> We're not sure how to wipe out the chimeral T-cells after they destroy the cancer, though I do have this vial of smallpox. Um, and so I, I think no modern talk on immunotherapy would be complete uh, without this figure, which I'm sure you guys have seen a lot. But if you haven't, just to, to frame it for you, um, each dot represents a, a tumor normal pair from a single patient. And on the y-axis, in a log scale, there are the median number of coding mutations per megabyte, megabase. And then they're sorted by median number of mutations per disease. So on the left, you have diseases like leukemias and sarcomas that are relatively mutation poor or silent. And on the right, you have tumors like lung cancer, melanoma, that are driven by a large number of mutations. And what this results in is different tumor microenvironments. On the right, you end up with one that's, by necessity, for survival of the tumor, is highly immunosuppressive, things like T regulatory cells that try to quiet an immune response. Whereas on the left, you have an environment, because the low neoantigen burden, it's not nearly as immunosuppressive. Um, and if you were to overlay um, these two circles in the upper right and the purple circle, you can see um, where checkpoint inhibition has largely been highly successful in patients with a large number of neoantigens, whereas the gray circle is, is one that some people propose might be uh, a useful target for CAR T-cell therapy in which the immune, uh, immune environment is not so suppressed. Um, and indeed, in the, in the red squares, um, you can see uh, the different diseases where CAR T-cell therapy has already shown brisk responses, ALL, CLL, uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and multiple myeloma. Um, and so just using that as a jumping off point, I'd like to talk about a few uh, exciting topics in, in CAR T-cell therapy, um, including uh, approved agents um, and uh, agents probably coming soon to approval, um, failure in CAR T-cell therapy, uh, how the tumor changes itself to, um, to escape CAR T-cell therapy, CAR T-cell toxicity, and then unmet needs. And so just going back to basics, this is a slide that summarizes um, uh, the two FDA-approved FDA uh, product structure. So uh, I'll use their um, brand names for simplicity. Uh, Yaskarta and Kimraya on the left are both FDA-approved, while Lysacel um, is another competitor from Juno that is, is not yet approved, um, but is showing promising results. And so the, the basic structure is that most um, CAR T cells uh, are utilized a single chain variable fragment derived from an antibody, and all, C all three of these products use the same uh, single chain derived from the same antibody. Um, next is a hinge domain, which acts as a, basically a spacer between the single chain variable fragment and the transmembrane domain. And there's a transmembrane domain. Um, next is a co-stimulatory domain, and this seems to be one of the, um, the biggest variables in constructs and the effect uh, on how these CAR T cells behave. Um, and most CAR T cells, modern CAR T cells, are either using CD28 or 41BB, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Finally, they have the primary activation domain, uh, CD3 Zeta, which is common uh, to, to most of the CAR T cell products. Another difference is the modality of gene transfer, either lentivirus um, or retroviruses. And then finally, one uh, major difference with the lysocell product on the right, again, which is not FDA approved, is um, they deliver this product in a defined CD4 to CD8 ratio, uh, which they believe um, imparts uh, uh, better persistence and efficacy and lower toxicity in their product. And so just thinking about how these products are delivered to patients, it's actually a modern marvel of, of uh, cellular engineering. And, and, and uh, patients are harvested locally, so they undergo phoresis. Um, their cells are shipped to the manufacturing uh, facility where they're exposed to GMP-grade virus. Um, T cells are then expanded under uh, different manufacturing conditions. Uh, they undergo quality control testing for things um, uh, like transduction efficiency, um, contaminants, things of that nature. Um, they're shipped to the patients, and most patients undergo lymphodepleting chemotherapy, which we'll talk a little bit about before the, the cells are administered. Um, and now we're starting to acquire some of the mature data um, in, in CAR T cell therapy. 
um, for several different diseases, and I'll go through a few of them. And so this is um, uh, the Zoom 1 trial, um, which looked at Yaskarda in relapse refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma in about 100 patients with multiple subtypes of aggressive lymphomas. Um, uh, overall response rates were uh, over 80% with complete response rates initially on the order of 60%. Um, and I think this is the key, um, key finding at almost uh, over 30 months is that these responses seem to be durable. Um, there's no drop off in that survival curve, which is really exciting for patients who are refractory essentially to all other therapies. Um, and you can see among patients who responded, um, this is showing CRs and PRs, most of those patients maintain their response um, when they did acquire one. Um, looking at the, the competitor project, this is Kim Raya from Novartis. Um, they just published their update as well in, in January in the New England Journal. Um, again, uh, sort of similar results with a response rate over 50%, um, uh, with CR rates on the order of 40% initially. Um, and then over time, um, CR rates uh, uh, sort of matching um, essentially what was seen with Yaskarta. And just to summarize um, sort of the three products, I won't talk about uh, Lysacel, which has not yet been approved, and the data has only been presented in abstract form, but you can see the two cohorts that they separate out on the right here. Um, I think the, the key differences I'll, I highlight between the different products um, are, one, is looking at the number of patients never treated. Um, and so with the Novartis product, Kimraya, there's been some difficulties with manufacturing. As you can imagine, this is a highly technical process that um, everyone is still trying to figure out. And Novartis especially, for whatever reason, had a hard time manufacturing their product. Um, and this led to actually a third of patients actually never even receiving their cells. Um, and essentially, as a necessity, they require that all patients receive bridging chemotherapy just to sustain these very, very sick patients um, to be able to get their cells um, for infusion. Uh, the next thing I'll point out is the CR rate has actually been largely similar despite the differences in manufacturing, the differences in constructs. Um, they seem to yield um, pretty, uh, pretty comparable clinical results with CR rates that are durable on the order of 30%. Next, looking at toxicity, we'll talk a little bit more about the nature of cytokine release syndrome a little bit later, but just for, for now, looking at the numbers, um, it seems like, again, these were different grading systems. There was recently um, released consensus grading uh, guidelines from ASBMT on toxicity, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later briefly. Um, but just noting that it seems like the, the lysocell product seems to have less high-grade CRS. Um, one caveat to that is that uh, clinicians have become much more proactive in trials as well in treating CRS, um, so that's maybe a bit of a confounding factor. Next, looking at neurotoxicity, which is probably the most feared complication of uh, CAR T-cell therapy in which patients can develop fatal cerebral edema. Um, High-grade neurotoxicity is most common uh, with Yaskarta, and this is certainly something we see in the clinic. Um, it seems to be a bit more of a toxic product, which we'll, we'll also mention later. Um, and looking at responses in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, um, these have generally been higher than lymphoma, so on the order of 60 to actually 100% uh, with, with lysocell, um, which is, is quite dramatic for, again, a heavily uh, pretreated population that's refractory to other therapies. Toxicity is also more severe in this population, and I'll just highlight in the ROCKET trial, this was a CD28, CD28 uh, co-stimulatory domain-based uh, CAR T-cell. Um, JCAR 015, uh, which led to um, five fatal cases of cerebral edema and was actually pulled from the market. Um, so again, uh, toxicity is, is an ongoing concern. Um, but it seems like it's, it's probably disease intrinsic. And so um, I apologize, this won't be in your slide deck. This, uh, these two studies actually just came out in the last week. On the left, um, we have the BCMA uh, CAR T cell from Bluebird, the BB2121, um, and a New England Journal study led by our own Newport Rajay from Mass General. Um, and on the right, you have also actually a, a quite similar car, also a BCMA. They both have the 41BB co-stimulatory domain. Um, and responses were actually quite different between the two trials. On the left, um, it seems like maybe there were less patients with, um, with very high-risk cytogenetics, less patients with 17, 17P deletion compared to the right. Um, but another major difference uh, was actually lymphodepleting chemotherapy. So only one of the three cohorts, or actually, sorry, two of the co three cohorts on the right um, received uh, lymphodepleting chemotherapy, but it was just cyclophosphamide, whereas all patients in the Bluebird study re received cyclophosphamide and fludarabine. Um, you can see the two PFS curves uh, on, on the left and the right. One other notable finding is that in the Bluebird study, of the 16 patients um, who had a valuable disease for MRD testing, they were all negative um, at 10 to the negative four cells, which was, which was quite striking. Unfortunately, it seems that um, a number of these patients go on to relapse with about 40% of patients who had initial response relapsing despite MRD negative status. And just 
drafting a hierarchy of these responses among the tumors that we have um, some, some initial data on. This is almost out of date. This is from the New England Journal article just last year from Carl June and Michelle Satterline. Um, it seems like ALL has the best responses, um, followed by CLL, which uh, I didn't have time to talk about, but has not yet been approved. Diffuse large B cell lymphoma and other lymphomas, um, and then multiple myeloma with variable responses depending on the product, um, followed by solid tumors, which we'll dive into briefly. There's been a smattering of reports of aggressive, uh, of good responses in sarcomas, uh, things like mesotheliomas, but nothing um, predictable. Um, and thinking about how this technology is expanding across the globe, um, just looking at the number of patents um, in clinical trials uh, on the top right uh, and, um, and bottom right, uh, these are growing exponentially, as you can imagine. And actually, I think one surprising finding um, is actually the, the number of clinical trials in China now exceeds those available in the U.S. Um, and so it seems like the United States and China are the, the two leading centers uh, for this technology. And so getting into the, some of the, the nitty-gritty aspects of, of CAR T-cell therapy and thinking about why CAR T-cells fail in some patients, there's a number of avenues that have been explored, um, but just to go for a few is, um, one is product manufacturing, and I already mentioned the, the Novartis issue with manufacturing, but there's a lot of important considerations. A lot of these patients have undergone a substantial amount of chemotherapy. Um, they may be neutropenic, they may have high blast burdens in their marrow, um, and you actually need a, a, a substantial number of lymphocytes to be able to manufacture CAR T cells. Um, so important considerations um, in thinking about the, the prior regimens that the patients have gotten and how lymphotoxic those can be. Um, other issues are um, uh, disease intrinsic, and so I'll show some data about how different um, cancers actually seem to affect the intrinsic potency of, uh, of T cells even before they're manufactured into CAR T cells. Um, uh, manufacturing is a very active area of research in which different groups are trying to add cytokines, small molecules like PI3 kinase inhibitors that are seem to um, improve function of CAR T cells. And finally, I've already shown um, in the BCMA story what seems to be an improvement with adequate lymphodepletion, which may vary from disease to disease. Um, it's an important consideration. Uh, and so this study just came out last month uh, from the University of Pennsylvania looking at pediatric cancer patients um, from a variety of malignancies, I think more than 10 malignancies, um, and took a blood sample at the beginning of therapy and then uh, after each subsequent cycle of chemotherapy um, and looked at both uh, their function and their phenotype. Um, and so representative examples of the extremes are shown um, here on the, on the top and bottom. Um, so on the left upper panel, you have um, the patients who had Ewing sarcoma. And then you see their blood samples after each round of chemotherapy, zero through nine. Um, and what they did was they used a, sort of an in-house assay that was a surrogate for uh, manufacturing conditions and assigned each patient either a pass or fail. And what you can see is the Ewing sarcoma patients, um, even at baseline, it seemed like they would have had a very hard time um, uh, manufacturing T cells for them. Whereas on the bottom with standard risk ALL, which is kind of the poster child for CAR T cell therapy, most of these patients, even in the midst of chemotherapy, um, would have been able to have T cells manufactured for the, their disease, though this declined with uh, subsequent cycles of chemotherapy. Looking at the rights at different T cell subsets, you can see that the UN sarcoma patients over time, um, their entire T cell compartment became almost uh, all terminal effector cells. Uh, which uh, are sort of less desirable for CAR T cell uh, therapy given their limited um, persistent capacity, whereas the, the ALL patients had a more balanced uh, phenotype throughout their different cycles of chemotherapy. Um, so again, thinking about the disease itself and how it may be playing an immune suppressive role on your CAR T cell patients. Next, I want to discuss uh, one of the most uh, comprehensive looks at uh, response and resistance um, that's been published to date. This was based on um, a CD19 CAR for CLL. Um, and one of the first things that the authors did was that they took the, the, T, the CAR T cells um, at the time of infusion um, from the patients who responded and did not respond um, and also uh, used some healthy donor CAR T cells. Um, and they put them into mouse models of leukemia. And they wanted to ask, does this recapitulate the same uh, findings that we saw in the clinic? And indeed it did. And what this tells us is that uh, it seems to be, at least in CLL, that uh, failure to respond is, is not that the disease is, is uh, becoming resistant or losing antigen. It's actually the, the T cells themselves seem to be intrinsically flawed, um, perhaps after multiple rounds of chemotherapy or, or age or, or um, some undefined factor. When they dug a little bit deeper at the, the T cells that were released from different patients, they saw that there were certain um, uh, phenotypic populations that seemed to predict response um, uh, to therapy. And so uh, maybe just a small subset of these cells was responsible for the clinical effect. 
Um, also looking at the infusion sample, so these are the, the CAR T cells right before they're infused in the patient, they found, seem to find another population of, of, of T cells, CAR T cells that seem to mediate that effect. And when they went back to their mouse model and they depleted that one population that they felt was responsible for response, they're able to see a dramatic survival difference in their mouse model, indicating that maybe this one population is, is actually driving responses, at least in CLL in this cohort. Next, thinking about lymphodepleting chemotherapy. Um, so fortunately, over the last 10 years, we have a lot of data from melanoma, from um, investigators trying to expand uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Um, and this has shown us that lymphodepleting chemotherapy may help with a, a variety of things, including depletion of T regulatory cells, myelo-derived suppressor cells, um, decreasing uh, unfavorable uh, metabolites, increasing co-stimulatory molecules, and generally allowing CAR T cells to, uh, to improve persistence um, and function. Indeed, in um, a, a series of trials from, uh, from the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center um, in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma with a CD19-based CAR, they showed that when comparing a high and a low-intensity lymphodepleting regimen, they were able to see substantial progression-free survival improvements with a higher-intensity lymphodepletion. This was based on earlier data where they compared um, a cyclophosphamide alone lymphodepletion regimen with a, a cyclophosphamide fludarabine regimen. Um, and down at the bottom here, you can see the complete responders, 8% versus just 50%. Again, all patients receive the same CAR T cell product, indicating that there's, there's more variables than just the CAR T cells themselves. Um, and then I want to tell a story of just um, how potent this technology can be. Um, and so this is uh, essentially a case report from the University of Pennsylvania based on a single patient who was treated with CAR T cell therapy. After his first infusion, he, he didn't really have a response, and so they had residual cells left over and they infused him a second time, and he had sort of interesting delayed uh, kinetics of response that led to further investigations. And just as some background, um, when when the transgene is inserted into a patient's T cells using lentiviruses, it's inserted semi-randomly. Um, and so sometimes it just happens that the CAR, um, the chimeric antigen receptor DNA, is inserted into the middle of uh, a gene in the human genome. And in this patient, it inserted it into the epigenetic regulator TET2. It just so happened that this patient also had a germline hypomorphic mutation in TET2, so all of his cells had only one functional copy of TET2. And so, essentially, this rendered this one single T cell with no functional copy of TET2. And as some of you may know, TET2 is implicated in, um, in MPNs and leukemia progression. Um, and in this case, it provided that one T cell with a survival advantage, such that it went on to 29 population doublings and was able to eradicate the entirety of this patient's tumor. So he still has evidence of this T cell circulating in his system over five years later, and has not progressed to, uh, to a T cell malignancy, which obviously would be a concern, and he's watched very closely. And just looking at his kinetics in the upper left, um, you can see a CLL burden after his first and second infusion, uh, which essentially went to zero, and then his uh, CAR T cell copy number on the bottom left, um, which again, a short-lived uh, persistence after the first infusion, then after a second infusion, continued persistence now over five years. When they looked at TCR um, clonality, so, uh, so uh, um, breaking them down into each, each type of T cell in his system at the time, you can see a very diverse group um, at the time of infusion um, with the, the T cell in question um, in red. However, several months later, um, he, the, that one T cell grew out and uh, went on to uh, sort of make up the entirety of the CD8 compartments um, within this patient. Um, thinking about antigen modulation, and so um, a lot of people have talked about uh, antigen loss in CAR T cell therapy, and this seems to be a phenomenon that's seen um, primarily in ALL in which 50%, up to 50% of patients uh, may lose the target antigen, CD19, which makes sense because it's not needed for, um, for ALL blast survival, um, and so it seems to be relatively easy for the tumor to lose this antigen and escape detection. And a genetic analysis of um, how this might happen. In the upper left, you can see uh, wild type CD19. Um, and then each one of these, um, these cartoons represents a patient who developed a, a separate um, unique mutation that led to, uh, to uh, loss of expression of CD19, which is a fairly humbling finding that all these mutations separately can lead to the same phenotype of, of resistance. And so as a way to evade um, this, this loss, CD19 loss, investigators have looked to other B-cell antigens. So CD20 and CD22 are other natural 
um, possibilities. Um, and in this trial, they treated patients who were CD19 resistant to, uh, to use a CD22-based CAR, and some of those patients relapsed. And what they saw was that most of those patients had downregulation of the CD22 antigen. Again, it seemed like the, the tumor was able to uh, play with antigen modulation to evade uh, detection. And when they modeled this in the lab, in the upper right, you can see what they did was they took NALM6, which is an ALL leukemia cell, uh, cell line, and they decreased its antigen density by half, making a NALM6 low cell line um, that uh, had C22 that was half as, half as much as the NALM6. And when they treated mice with these, these two different tumors, again, using the same CD22 CAR, um, it, it recapitulated what they saw in patients in that the mice with the, the low antigen density um, were unable to, to clear tumors compared to the, the wild-type leukemia, showing just how important it is to match your CAR T-cell affinity um, to the desired antigen density. This is an active area of research with a number of trials looking at either um, combination uh, of the two agents or sequential treatment with each one. I talked earlier about the two different co-stimulator domains, which again is one of the most important parts of CAR T-cell design. It seems like the 41BB um, co-stimulator domain, which is in the Novartis product, um, leads to increased persistence, and these CAR T-cells are found years later, um, uh, like in the CLL patient, um, and they seem to have less toxicity. They're more reliant on oxidative metabolism um, and, and generally well tolerated, whereas the CD28 co-stimulator domain seems to be, um, uh, have very rapid expansion of kinetics associated with a little bit more toxicity um, and relies on glycolytic metabolism. And thinking about how to get the best of both worlds, um, Michelle Sadeline out of the Sloan Kettering um, uh, Hospital has looked at potentially combining both of these agents um, into a single product. And so this is a summary of uh, a number of mouse experiments. Um, you can see on the left the different conditions. So um, they took target antigen um, CD19 with high, medium, or low density um, uh, with CD22 low antigen density. And then they tried a series of different combinations of CARs um, with different co stimulatory domains targeting 19 and 22. And what they found was perhaps a, a mix of, of both co stimulatory domains um, uh, with the appropriate um, target was the best approach. And so this is something that's helping to drive um, clinical decisions and in, in trials in humans to, to evade this problem. So we've heard a lot about checkpoint inhibition, and um, a lot of people uh, reach a, a logical conclusion that maybe utilizing these to rescue therapy and, uh, in CAR T-cell patients might be reasonable. CAR T-cells can become exhausted. They can become mired in an immunosuppressive microenvironment. Um, and indeed, this seems to work in, in a subset of patients. Um, uh, a lot of patients end up with re-expansion, and a subset develop uh, robust responses. This has only been presented in abstract form. Um, it seems like in ALL, there's a subset of patients who might respond quite robustly, um, maybe those with bulky and extramedullary disease, but still a, a very active area of research that is by no means certain. What about reinfusion? Our CLL patient uh, with a TET2 mutation got a second infusion and was able to achieve a complete response. Well, it seems like this is, is pretty highly variable, maybe disease specific. Um, in the CD22 trial, um, after retreating with lymphodepleting chemotherapy, they were able to see um, uh, responses in that scenario. In a different trial, I'll show you just how important, again, lymphodepleting chemotherapy seems to be. Um, uh, in using cyclophosphamide alone versus Cyflu, they were able to see uh, robust re-expansion only in the Cyflu setting, not with cyclophosphamide alone. The clinical responses seem to mirror the kinetics of CAR expansion. Um, and then I just want to show a cautionary tale. This is rare. Um, but typically, after CAR T-cell infusion um, in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patients, we get a PET by day 30 and, and typically see a response, but occasionally there can be delayed responses. This is a patient who had delayed normalization of his PET scan, um, and it wasn't apparent until day 60, um, though he did have CAR T-cell persistence, which often mirrors um, a, a clinical response. Unfortunately, CAR T-cell quantification um, via PCR or other methodologies is not available clinically and only on a research basis. Um, this is another sort of case report and maybe the, the opposite side of the TET2 story showing again the, in, the incredible power of this technology and, um, and, and, and the concern and, and use of caution um, in some cases. And so this is a patient who was treated with acute lymphoblastic leukemia um, and he was treated initially um, and uh, after treatment it was shown that he had persistence of his leukemic blasts. However, on flow cytometry, there's no evidence of CD19, and the thought was initially that he had a CD19 a negative relapse, as we've already discussed. 
However, because this is in the context of a, a clinical trial, they're able to um, quantify his, his, uh, the amount of CAR present. And what they found on further investigation was actually that at the time of manufacturing, while they, we typically forese T cells, it's also possible to get contamination um, from leukemic cells, especially if disease burden is high in the blood at the time of phoresis. And so this patient happened to have one leukemic blast that received uh, a CAR. Um, and, uh, and what happened was that the uh, CD19 bound to the CAR, um, rendering that leukemic blast invisible to the other CARs um, and also to detection by flow cytometry. Um, and so unfortunately, this, this actually grew out and, and, and um, killed the patient. Um, so this is a, a pretty rare phenomenon. It's only been reported in, in one or two cases, um, but obviously something to, to watch out for. And thinking about toxicity, no talk on CAR T-cell um, would be complete without that. Um, there are sort of target intrinsic toxicities and uh, also uh, some toxicities that seem to be uh, sort of endemic to the, to the technology itself. And so the most, one of the most notable ones in, in C19-based cars is um, B-cell aplasia. C19 is expressed on normal B-cells. Um, this leads to hypogamma globulinemia, which is fortunately easily remedied with intravenous immunoglobulin. The other one that uh, you guys have heard a lot about is cytokine release syndrome, um, which is a capillary leak-like syndrome in which patients become hypotensive, hypoxic, and febrile, typically treated with uh, fevers, uh, um, uh, antipyrogens, um, uh, pressors, um, and supportive care, um, and uh, the um, anti-IL-6 antibody tocilizumab. And it was recognized early on in, um, in some of the first infusions that IL-6 was, was quite high in these patients, um, and the antibody rapidly mitigates uh, this type of toxicity in most patients. Um, steroids are also used in, in refractory settings. Um, other more rare toxicities include um, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, or HLH macrophagia activating syndrome, um, and then neurotoxicity um, is, is uh, relatively more common depending on the construct and disease. Um, these patients um, can have a gradation from um, sort of stupor um, all the way up to uh, obtundation and coma, um, seizures, and the most severe form, cerebral edema um, and herniation, uh, which is relatively rare. Um, and as we learn more and more about this technology, we try to work out the mechanism of how this may happen. Um, initially, it was thought that these cytokines were perhaps made by T cells, but most people thought IL-1 and IL-6, the T cells don't really make those, so it didn't make sense. Um, and so it, it seems like after engaging, uh, engagement of the T cell with tumor, they make cytokines like interferon gamma, GMCSF, that drives um, stimulation of macrophages were actually the culprit in, in driving the cytokine storm, uh, resulting in a feed-forward loop. In a very rational, rationally designed trial, um, some investigators looked at using um, tocilizumab prophylactically. If it helps later on, why not try it up front? Um, and what they actually saw paradoxically was an increase in neurotoxicity. And the theory behind this is that um, tocilizumab is an IL-6 receptor blocker. Um, and this prevents uh, ligand-mediated uh, endocytosis. Uh, so normally IL-6 binds its receptor, is taken into the cell and degraded. And what happens when you block the receptor, you get high levels of IL-6, and actually tocilizumab can't cross the blood-brain barrier, um, but IL-6 can. So you end up with a bunch of uh, IL-6 in the CNS where it can mediate its effects, um, including potentially worse um, neurotoxicity. Um, and this is just an example of a patient who unfortunately died from um, fatal cerebral edema, um, just profound swelling refractory to, to all, um, all measures. Um, and it seems like, like cytokine release syndrome and, and neurotoxicity go hand in hand. The patients who have the highest grade uh, CRS also have the highest grade neurotoxicity, um, as you can see here. Um, this is a very active area of research. Um, there's a lot of leads looking at maybe more upstream factors um, that might be able to prevent um, uh, toxicity. Uh, one particularly interesting one is IL-6 in animal models seem to prevent toxicity, neurotoxicity, and cytokine release syndrome while not impacting responses. Um, so maybe in the sake of time, I'll skip over some of the toxicities that we've seen over the last 10 years from different immune effector therapies. Um, but there's, there's been many, and it's, it's important to, to identify targets that seem to be unique. I do want to mention um, consensus grading criteria that just came out from the ASBMT, um, which is, um, I, I think, a really good thing. This is just uh, not meant to be read, just to show you that there were numerous grading systems um, developed over the last five to ten years for cytokine release syndrome um, and the toxicities of CAR T cells. Um, and so 
Um, working together, they developed a, a simplified version that's based just on fever, hypotension, hypoxia, and this serves as a simple guide for management um, and intensity of, of management. Um, there's also a separate grading system for, uh, for neurotoxicity, so there's this ICE score, immune effector, cell-associated uh, encephalopathy score based on some questions that can be done at the bedside. Um, and then uh, you can develop the ICANN score, um, which is meant to be a, a score that's usable for uh, a bunch of different immune effector cell types, including NK cells um, and other cell types, not just limited to CAR T cell therapy. Um, and if you're interested, um, uh, this is available through the ASBMT app, which is free um, through Android or the App Store. And then finally, just briefly covering on some unmet needs. So um, solid tumors are a, a very active area of research, which unfortunately has not seen the same kind of responses that we've seen um, in heme malignancies. Uh, and so there have been a few reported responses in diseases like mesothelioma and sarcomas, uh, but they're, they're quite rare. Our own Marcella Moss um, used a EGFR-B3 targeted CAR in glioblastoma. This is thought to be a very unique antigen on about 30% of uh, glioblastomas. These cells were infused peripherally, and patients who underwent subsequent resections, we were able to find them in the, in the CNS, but unfortunately patients didn't have a robust response. This is a case report in the New England Journal of a patient who had a different targeted CAR um, who actually had his cells delivered intraventricularly, actually a number of infusions, had a complete response um, uh, before ultimately relapsing. Um, and so our own lab, um, under uh, a lot of work by uh, Brian Choi, who's a neurosurgeon in the lab, has been working on sort of the next iteration of the, um, the EGFR V3 CAR. And so this is an EGFR V3 CAR um, that also secretes a bispecific antibody. Um, so sort of similar to blinitumumab, if you're familiar with that, which is a CD3, CD19 bispecific engager. Utilized in leukemia, this is a CD3 um, EGFR bispecific engager, so it recruits um, uh, bystander T cells to also help join the fight um, in addition to the CAR T cell. Um, so again, a lot of active area uh, research in this area. Um, this is just meant to show the number of trials in cell tumors is, is very, very large, um, and uh, a lot of people are working on this problem. Um, and finally, I'll just, I'll just mention uh, allogeneic CAR T cells uh, would be a really nice solution um, uh, that's, that's really exciting. And so right now we have to uh, freeze people, um, uh, take their T cells, ship them off for manufacturing. We have to grow them for weeks and stabilize them in the meantime while they have very aggressive diseases. Um, and many of these patients, their immune system's been beat up with chemotherapy. Their T cells um, may not be as functional because of age or prior chemotherapy or their disease. So this would be a nice solution. Um, unfortunately, it seems like there's, there's some strong risk of graft-versus-host disease, immune rejection through next-generation technologies like CRISPR. We're, we're trying to work these out um, by ablating um, antigen presentation systems, though this opens uh, the cells uh, to attack to NK cells, which try to um, eliminate cells that don't have MHC uh, expression. Um, so this is an ongoing area of research. It's already been tried in the clinic in um, a few small trials primary and pediatric patients, there were um, good responses. Patients had, it seemed like mild graft-versus-host disease um, on initial reports, um, but these patients underwent planned allogeneic transplants, so uh, we won't be able to see um, how it would have played out in the absence of that. Um, and so with that, uh, I'll take any questions, and, and thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Mark. That was fantastic. That was a real sort of tour de force uh, summary of, a, of, a, of a incredibly expanding. And I think, you know, the, the, one of the things about this particular corner is it is sort of advances and updates in the field. And, and you know, what a change we've seen in the last 12 months between this, the course, what we ran last year, um, in terms of what you need to cover here. So we've probably got uh, time for one or two questions on the CAR T space, if there are questions from the audience. No, it's a sunny day outside. Oh, there's one here. Okay. Hi, I um, work on Lunder 9 at Mass General, and we have somebody who's just received a CAR T cell infusion for the third time. Yeah. And I guess I'm wondering what would be the rationale for repeat CAR T cell infusions? Is it because of like presumed T cell exhaustion? and why would we think it might work if it hadn't worked before? No, that's a really good question. And so I can point to some of the anecdotes um, that have already come out. So in the, uh, the, the TET2 patient, that patient had initial uh, infusion with no response. 
um, had a second infusion, and only that second infusion had that one CAR T cell that was able to drive response. And I think that's an outlier. Um, but uh, other strategies are, um, I, I showed some data that was very briefly, but um, some, some groups are doing escalating um, uh, lymphodepletion with a second dose. Um, so, so in that scenario, maybe if you're giving more lymphodepletion, um, then maybe you get a, a better persistence. Um, other, other people are doing escalating doses after a first dose. Um, so it, it does see, one thing we didn't talk about is that, that it seems like a lot of these um, uh, dose relationship seems to be a factor that can, can drive response. Um, so that's another sort of dial you can play with. Great. There's no more last questions, and I'll uh, th th thank, thank Mark once again. <laughs>